This is Close Reads, a philosophy podcast with Mark and Wes. I'm Wes Alwyn. And I'm Mark Linsenmeyer. It's, uh, let's call it the Partially Examined Life, episode 300. All right, we're going to have to remove this beginning because I didn't have the episode number ready. <laughs> It's the Partial Examine Life, episode 329, part three. We're going to do a close reads here of Kierkegaard. We're doing Kierkegaard's The Concept of Irony from 1841, the conclusion. The conclusion, which is called Irony as a Controlled Element, the Truth of Irony. It is uh, page 324 in the text. Start us off, Wes, unless you have any introductory thoughts having listened to the PEL episode on this. No, let me let me start us off, and then I did okay. listen to the episode, and um, but yeah, it'll come out. All right. It has already been pointed out in the foregoing that in his lectures on aesthetics, Soldier Solger Solger makes irony the condition for every artistic work. When we know, when we now in this context say that the poet must be related ironically to his writing. This means something different from what was said about this earlier. Shakespeare has frequently been eulogized as the grand master of irony, and there can be no doubt that there is justification for that. But by no means does Shakespeare allow the substantive worth to evaporate into an ever more fugitive sublimate. And as for the occasional culmination of his lyrics in madness, there is an extraordinary degree of objectivity in this madness. When Shakespeare is related ironically to what he writes, it is precisely in order to let the objective dominate. Irony is now everywhere present. It sanctions every single line so that there will be neither too much nor too little, in order that everything can have its due, in order that the true balance may be achieved in the miniature world of the poem, whereby the poem has the center of gravity in itself. Maybe we should stop um, there because it's a very long paragraph. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we're, wow, we're being this dropped is... in and we don't care about who Soldier is. He's a he's another playwright. I mean, it's 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 what is being quoted that's important. Irony is necessary for every kind of art. Um, I just want to say this is like the clearest thing I've ever read by Kierkegaard. <laughs> <laughs> um, and also the most enjoyable. <laughs> uh, I think he's right. In a way, well, to the extent that I un understand him. So Shakespeare is eulogized as the grand master of irony. But what but, is his, the uh, the extraordinary degree of objectivity? That That's what makes the irony good as opposed to mere subjectivity. I'm not really sure I understand. Do, do you understand the difference here? Just throwing us in here? Well, I think the objectivity has to do with yeah it's you know it strikes me as true but it's hard to explain so for instance aaron and i for subtext just did the winner's tale in which someone goes mad with jealousy and even though this particular play has been criticized because the main character just suddenly gets very jealous very quickly and it doesn't seem that there's any psychological basis for that in his previous behavior the Transition to jealousy, I think, is actually masterfully portrayed, and there's lots of little triggers in the environment that you might not notice that's, that work him up before you realize he's been worked up, and then suddenly he flips. So there's that kind of psychological realism. I mm -hmm. think that's the, that's the thing I would associate most with this idea of objectivity. But what is, why does he think Shakespeare is the master of irony? Or why is he agreeing with critics that Shakespeare is the master of irony? Just from context, from having read this, the surrounding section earlier, I think it is, uh, I mean, it does come down to the, the realism, the skill that there involves a certain, he's not purely expressive, right? He certainly puts a lot of, uh, emotions and things in, but he is a craftsperson. And so that's what I'm associating irony with here is the artistic difference between 
the artist and the work that if you pure, purely just I'm expressing myself, then you do not have it is merely subjective. It is merely idiosyncratic and it does not get at some sort of deeper objective truth that readers would be able yeah. to find as well. If you're merely reflecting your own idiosyncrasies, then I, it's possible that readers will be similarly designed, but it's much that's not really the point of art. The point of art yeah. is to get at these. This is exactly in line with what the romantics, which Schlegel were recommending that art do so far. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say he, he kind of disappears into the background. That was going to be my take on this mm -hmm. with his, with irony. He doesn't, he's not him and his point of view aren't overwhelmingly present. His poetry is very present, but it's as if he lets the characters be what they are. And and that's part of what gives them a, a life of their own. And that's part of what accentuates the realism, strangely enough, even though the stories themselves are often fantastic. And just to try to think of if irony mm -hmm. is characterized overall as negation, as it can only just be that he's not, if you put yourself in with it as the writer, then you are advocating it then and there's not that artistic difference distance between you and the work uh you know that's like arguing positively for a philosophical proposition whereas in the earlier parts of this book he was praising socrates's uh negative yeah. uh, approach to philosophy and that is the ironic uh, approach so it's sort of i'm just saying you know so it's like shakespeare is presenting us with this simulacrum of of reality and just saying this is the truth as I see it yeah. like I'm not approving. I'm not disapproving. This right. is just what it is. This is this is what the poet Keats called negative capability. Mm. Instead of irritably reaching after reasons and truths, you submit yourself to the you know the 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 poetic truth. So Shakespeare, for instance, isn't eager to condemn the villain, even in some subtle way right everyone knows you'd be a hack if you're just trying to you know if the villain or the person who's acting acting in a villainous way at any given point is just presented as a kind of character Ooh, i'm evil you know instead we get a in a sense what's we always get a sympathetic portrait in the sense that we always get the the underlying psychology so negative capability and irony i think are related here and also you know this position of feigned naivete which comes which came up in the episode and you guys were talking about the relationship between rhetorical irony saying the opposite let's say um and and especially the expression of that expression of that and sarcasm and trying to relate that to socratic irony and i think in both of those you get feigned naivete so socrates pretending not to know in a sense he doesn't know in a sense he does that's the thing so uh, if he says all i know is my own ignorance okay but he knows it in a much different way right than the average person he knows more than the people that he's uh um antagonizing <laughs> so clearly he does know more than them and clearly what he's doing what often when he makes bad arguments that the bad arguments are meant to teach a teach a lesson or the dialectical arguments in which he makes other people's positions collapse which sometimes are also bad arguments um that dialectical position it's very similar to hegel in which you you simply observe the position or you bring its light and you let it defeat itself which takes mm -hmm. him out of the picture to some extent but even in like rhetorical irony there's feigned naivete. So if I go into, I'm reading a really great book now. Um, oh, fuck. What's the name of this guy? <laughs> Is it Unfrozen um, Caveman Lawyer? Uh, Sorry, that's what I've been thinking. It, it's by an English professor um, whose name is now escaping me. But um, but I'm going to talk, I'll talk about this book some other time. But uh, anyway the one of the examples it's a it's really really one of the best things i've read on humor in in general but the, the example he uses is someone walks into an office and says 
and and there's a they have a coworker who has really bad handwriting. It looks like chicken scratch. And they say, "Oh, I didn't know you could do shorthand." So a bit of mm. sarcasm. The there's a feigned naivete, right? Oh, I'm so stupid. I think your bad handwriting is shorthand. Uh, and that kind of feigned naivete always happens in that sarcastic iron, attacking irony, which is like the prototypical example. Someone messes something up. You say, oh, great job. You're pretending like you think this person did a great job. You're asking them to inhabit that position with you where someone is so stupid as to think the terrible thing that you did is a good or great job. So the feigned naivete is always a part of it. I'm not sure if that was brought out in the podcast or not because I was listening at like triple speed. <laughs> so, uh, so you have to remind me. Uh, well, let's let's uh, keep going here. Or did we get up to? So, I think the greater the greater the contrasts. The contrasts yeah. yeah. All right. So he's just said irony is in every word. Uh, Shakespeare lets the objective dominate. The greater the contrasts in the movement, the more is irony required to direct and control the spirits that willfully want to change, want to charge forward. The more irony is present, the more freely and poetically the poet floats above his artistic work. Therefore, irony is not present at some particular point of the poem, but is omnipresent in it, so that the irony visible in the poem is in turn ironically controlled. Therefore, irony simultaneously makes the poem and the poet free. But in order for this to happen, the poet himself must be master over the irony. But this does not always mean that just because a poet manages to be master over the irony at the time of writing, he's master over it in the actuality to which he himself belongs. It's customarily said that the poet's personal life is of no concern to us. This is absolutely right, but in the present undertaking, it should, be out of, it should not be out of place to point out the misrelation that can often exist in this respect. Okay, so it's not a simple task to float above your work. There is some kind of craft and mastery and attitude, I think, psychological attitude. I think there's some of it's just impulse control. It's, it's hard not to caricature the villain, for instance. And well, and it's hard, it might it, even come out unconsciously, even if you don't want to do it. But go ahead. It's hard for me not to put in little... Uh, fourth wall breaking comments or something to i i want to comment on you know but you know you gotta you gotta actually dress that up in the artistic so what you were just saying about the uh feigned simplicity it's like we're we as americans at least do sarcasm wrong because it has that oh great job whereas good sarcasm should just be you know i see you do an obviously stupid thing i'm like great job like mm -hmm. and and you're like well, fuck you. Like it should make you want. Yeah. Yeah. The drier, the better. Yeah. But it, you know, some of this varies on context. If you say that line about the, the shorthand to a friend who knows they have bad handwriting, it's much less of an attack. And part of the feigned innocence, right? Or na naivete is to give yourself a, an alibi to the attack. Like, oh, I didn't, wasn't meaning to attack you, even though. Both of you know that, you know, so it's a weird, it's a weird thing. But if someone knows they have bad handwriting and it's something you joke about all the time and they could go, yeah, they could go along with, you guys could riff off that and you could go along with, I could, you know, you say that to me and I'd say, yeah, my mom really, she taught me calligraphy or something and you could just go back and forth. But if it's someone you don't know, or maybe you have an antagonistic relationship and you say that to them, that's just an attack. So it, it really can range between something good humored where you're assisting someone else's self-deprecation or maybe even you know that they have a harsh inner critic and you're trying to pretend to be that harsh inner critic so you give them a perspective on how silly it seems when it's outside of them you can actually be doing it in a way that's trying to alleviate their own self-attack there are all these mm -hmm. complicated layers but in this case i i find it really interesting he's pointing to this distinction between like the kind of self-control and control that would go into artistic irony and the fact that you may not be able to do any of that in your own personal life. Because a sense of irony, I think, would make one less self-attacking, for instance. That's just one of the things it might do. Yeah, I, I don't think we spelled out 
in the in the full episode how one could be earnest uh mm. and and ironic at the same time but i think the kind of thing that you're talking about is somebody makes you know a terrible and obvious mistake and they're probably about to attack themselves about it and you're like that's not the way to do it come on mm-hmm. you know you know you you make it gentler like exactly. you're speaking in in or you're saying literally what should be said but that nobody would actually say it that way if they were you know be actually criticizing you right right so they're they're I, again i think they're trying to help you in some of those circumstances we try to help each other i've been thinking about this a lot i've been trying to observe my own irony and situations and ask myself well what motivates it um often i think it's anxiety it's some kind of threat or anxiety what motivates in the situation why are we joking around um really think about the psychological dynamics of it which i think is what you have to do to really understand it and what i haven't seen done except in this book which ironically i can't remember the name of the author right now because i'm uh dementia is is gradually setting in but we'll, but, we'll put it in the episode notes <laughs> making it dramatic irony to you right now the audience right? knows what it is. exactly the, that's perfect but it um yeah but this whole thing in the per, you know personal life versus being an artist some people are really good at being kind to their characters and kind to the substance of their work but can they do that to themselves maybe maybe he's talking about more than that i'm immediately associating the that in particular where you are a character in your own narrative but you caricature yourself um you're not floating above yourself you're um you're so deeply invested in um maybe it's in the future maybe it's in one's ideal self right you're so forward looking that the present you the pre- you can't let the present just be the present Well, and just discussing like, you know, what are your purposes for irony? Like, we'll talk about this. Uh, actually, tomorrow we're recording on either or uh, the beginning from from Kierkegaard, and he's depicting this sort of romantic character uh, talking about himself. And it's sort of like if if joking about everything is just a default thing that you do because sort of what the what the hell else is there to do with life? <laughs> There's some mm-hmm. sort of something kind of nihilistic and graveyard humor about it. That maybe is not the best attitude to have, uh, you know, when irony is all consuming. And I, you know, I take this critique entirely personally. So. Yeah. I mean, maybe it's a particular kind of irony. So there's the kind of good natured self soothing irony that I've been describing. And then there's sarcasm. There's bitter, cynical sarcasm where so there's and and the same thing there's negative capability in keats sense where you're you're not irritably reaching after reasons but then there's just the whole oh yeah i don't believe anything and you know not even in right and wrong and everyone sucks and blah 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 you could not believe in anything in the world in the sense that you're just disaffected with it and you can't take anything seriously anymore I mean, you've you've now given the the counter argument to my own self critique, which is I think the sort of gentle we're all in it together sort of irony. Mm-hmm. Like I think it's very hard for me to tell the difference between gentle we're all in it together irony and you know what are you gonna do? Like what <laughs> that sort of <laughs> is that nihilistic or is that this is just the style by which we live, which is maybe deflationary upon. Uh, you know, there's no grand things we should be reaching towards, so we might as well engage in Seinfeld-esque chatter about the weather or whatever, uh, because that's there's really nothing more important to bother with, which is fundamentally yeah. the thing that Kierkegaard is going to be against. Like, no, there are serious ethical things, there are serious religious things that you should be that should be directing your life, and so living in this it, it is to to him a form of nihilism. But one could respond and and say, no, actually, you are being the serious man. Those are those are bullshit, and this is the only reasonable way to be. I don't want to. We're we're about to have a whole discussion on that. So, yeah, we can move forward. But it, yeah, it's yeah. all on how it depends on how it affects the way you function in life, and mm-hmm. does it make you a nihilist, or does it does it help you get things done, or does it just make you give up? And people often face this 
problem. If I'm too kind to myself, well, how would I get any get anything done? I have to crack the whip. It's a similar mm. sort of problem where it's like stop attacking yourself. But well, what am I? Am I just going to eat Doritos on the couch all day then? Or <laughs> <laughs> what are you going to do? So how do I do things without attacking myself? But anyway, all right. Uh, top of three twenty five. In addition, the less the poet remains in the immediate position of genius, the greater becomes the significance of this misrelation. The more the poet has abandoned this, the more necessary it is for him to have a totality view of the world, and in this way to be master over irony in his individual existence. And the more necessary it becomes for him to be a philosopher to a certain degree. If this is the case, then the individual... The individual poetic work will not have a merely external relation to the poet. In the individual poem, he will see an element in his own development. The reason Goethe's post, the reason Goethe's poet existence was so great, was that he was able to make his poet life congruous with his actuality. But that in turn takes irony, but please note controlled irony. For the romanticist, the individual poetic work is either a darling favorite with which he is himself utterly infatuated and which he cannot explain to himself, how could he possibly have given life to it, or it is an object that arouses disgust. Both responses, of course, are false. The truth of the matter is that the individual work is an element. In Goethe, irony was, in the strictest sense, a controlled element. It was a serving spirit to the poet. On the one hand, the individual poem rounds itself off in itself by means of the irony in it. On the other hand, the individual poetic work emerges as an element, and thereby the whole poet existence rounds itself off by means of irony. I'll just, I'll just finish this. <clears throat> as poet, Professor Heiberg takes the same position. And while almost every line of dialogue he has written can provide an, a, an example of irony's inner economy in the play, all of his plays exhibit the conscious striving to assign to every particular line its place in the whole. Here, then, the irony is controlled, is reduced to an element. The essence is nothing other than the phenomenon. The phenomenon is nothing other than the essence. Possibility is not so prudish as to be unwilling to enter into any actuality, but actuality is possibility. Goethe, both the striving and the victorious Goethe, was always acknowledged, has always acknowledged this view, has continually arc articulated his view, this view very energetically. So we keep Ooh. keep in mind that poet poetry is often drama. He's off. That's typically what he's thinking of as as plays. Um, but go ahead. <clears throat> yeah, no, that's there's a lot. That was a whole page of a paragraph. He had been previously talking about the misrelation that can exist between the poet's personal life and the work, right? Yeah. We, we should not actually care about the personal life. Uh, but, okay, so the less the poet remains in the immediate position of genius, the greater becomes the significance of this misrelation between the personal life and the work. What is the, the immediate position of genius? I don't know, but it sounds like, you know, a... A genius can be can afford to be the person who's very disordered in their personal mm. life and yet capable of great poetry. But all right, so let's let's if go they're on more that of hypothesis. a work a day, yeah, if they're more of a work a day type person than they. It sounds like he's saying they need to have be a master of irony in their individual existence in order to make it work in the poem or play itself to be a philosopher so if you're a genius then <clears> you are just idiot savant like channeling the divine and <laughs> good on you <ya>. but yeah. probably uh i was just with some people yesterday who were saying it's just amazing we we're talking about sequels and things and you know it's amazing enough when you can create when an artist can create one thing that resonates, you know, the first star Wars movie or whatever. And like anything after that should just be gravy. And like, it's, it's very unlikely that any follow-ups or whatever are going to have anything of the punch. Uh, well, yeah. Okay. If you take that as, 
you know, you've, you've stumbled on something that maybe what genius is this uh, being in the immediate position of genius is stumbling on the divine in this way, like something that really resonates. Okay. Well, even the greatest genius Shakespeare say, or Goethe, I don't know, is, is not going to stumble in that way. So the more that you, you're, you're just, okay. I had the divine inspiration, but now I want to have the rest of my career. I'm still a very good craftsperson, but you know, you want to take the attitude of a workaday artist, as you were saying, but you know, you still want to have, make your work as great as possible. You're someone who's capable of genius. How can you push your work so you don't have to stumble across the divine that you can, you know, make it consistently very strong? Well, uh, become a philosopher to some degree, be a master of irony in your individual existence. Uh, this is exactly what Nietzsche was was criticizing Goethe, that Goethe became a zealot for Christianity later in his work. Mm -hmm. And I don't know the time periods where exactly Kierkegaard was writing this in relation to what Goethe had produced. Uh, if you know, maybe Goethe hadn't made this turn yet, but it seems like Kierkegaard would have been just fine with that turn <laughs> toward more ascetic Christianity. Uh, mm -hmm. And so the fact that he was able to live that life. And not just, you know, that seems like a very uh, a high degree of integrity that, that Goethe has exhibited according to Kierkegaard, whereas, uh, you know, Nietzsche just saw this as, as just a failure to take on the fundamental challenge of life, you know, accepting the absurd or what, however he, he would put it. Yeah, well, Nietzsche had turned against romanticism and and Wagner, right? The great representative of that romanticism. And, I'm confusing and, Wagner and Goethe. Oh, are Sorry. you? Okay. He would, he criticized Wagner for exactly right, this thing. Right. God damn. All right. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> but, um, but I don't think it's unrelated. So, and then I think Kierkegaard's relationship to romanticism is complicated because he seems in a way like a romantic, but then he's a, he's a critic of it. But anyway, I mean, that could be just like, like the existentialists, half of the existentialists or most of the existentialists that were like too cool for the word existentialism and thought mm. that, that what they were doing specifically was so much, you know, so eh, maybe he's a romantic and he's just, yeah. that's the nature of romanticism is to be contrary to, uh, <laughs> right. Nietzsche, you know, but I was going to say Nietzsche foresaw how catastrophic romanticism was going to be for germany because it was connected to german nationalism mm. and back to the you know soil and blood and ethnic ethno nationalism and all that stuff and anti-semitism and he was completely right about that i mean ironically right nietzsche looks and writes a little bit like a romantic and was able to be appropriated he's very pro-semite very anti-nationalist very anti-romantic but he was used by those people because he talks about things like the will and instinct and he's against slave morality, all that stuff. But, but anyway, but it, so I think, um, all right, regardless of what Nietzsche said about Goethe or, uh, <laughs> Wagner, I don't, I'm a little, I think Nietzsche's, uh, probably has, yeah, I don't know what Nietzsche thinks of Goethe actually. Um, do, do, do we know, have, have we, did this, I, anything I we've read, has he talked much about Goethe? I don't think so. Probably, strangely, strangely enough, I mean, he probably does somewhere, but um, let's let's zoom in in the middles. For the romanticist, the individual poetic work is either a darling favorite, with which he himself is utterly infatuated, which he cannot explain to himself. In other words, he sees himself as the genius. I just this just rolled out of me. I, I, or it is an object that arouses his disgust. Uh, I've heard a lot of musicians that I've interviewed that are like, I don't listen to my old stuff. I don't, you know, or. You know, as soon as it comes out of me, it's gone. It's sort of, it, it is like th their shit. <laughs> yeah. It's the doing of it that is the purpose, not the, the having it there to a frame. Yeah, but why is it either or and how how does irony help? I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm familiar with this, right? You, you write a poem or you do something like that and you're like, ooh, look how great I am. This is amazing. And then five minutes later, you're like, oh my God. It's terrible, absolutely terrible. And if you're a writer, you, you, you're kind of always pushing through that. Um, I think Annie Dillard or Anne Lamont, maybe. Um, anyway, the, someone wrote a great essay called "Shitty First Drafts" and kind of made it mm. out 
said kind of claimed that <clears throat> the the whole key to writing is persistence in the sense that you have to deal with the blow to your pride involved in looking at those first drafts which are always bad and then trying to work through them and and craft them um so maybe that requires some degree of irony obviously if you you're too infatuated you're probably just de delusional and you can't actually do anything to refine your work and if you if it arouses disgust um i don't know well it says both responses are false the truth of the matter is the individual work is an element so it's an element in your life this is something oh, that is you that did. what he's saying well that's what he literally the next sentence is what he said <laughs> yeah uh in irony in goethe irony was the strictest sense a controlled element it was a serving spring to the poet so irony is an element of the work on the one hand and then the work as an element in what he doesn't really say here well irony and, is an element irony is a controlled element right to but serve the poet that, okay the individual work is an element all right I, I like that idea of, you know, take a Hegelian approach to your own work. Like, yeah, your first draft was bad, but the next one's going to be better. Like it, it, it is not both of those responses. Like, I don't know how I gave birth to this thing. Isn't it wonderful? Or geez. Okay. <laughs> I just crap that mm -hmm. out. Both of those are not taking responsibility for the work. You know, you have to, even though we don't consciously control every little thing and, and hire, I don't think Kierkegaard is recommending that we, you know, that you wouldn't actually create anything if you had to be that self-conscious about it. But, uh, you know, it's a, it's a matter of interaction back and forth with the things that we create. And then we react to those in the future things we create or in improving those things. And yeah, it's all just part of the process of hopefully becoming a better and better artist. Yeah. I mean, I, I like your idea of, the individual work as an element as some manifestation of a particular point in one's life. I don't know if that's what you were saying. So you, you can you have a certain, life, but yeah, yeah, you have a certain detachment from it. That's where the iron, uh, the irony comes in. You're not idealizing it or catastrophizing about it. It is what it is. You did your best to, craft it it's a reflection of your well person in some sense but anyway all right and then um, talks about this heiberg who yes who, we don't care who heiberg is but he apparently includes irony in a very nice controlled way as an element and then it gets the the, the latter part of what you read is where it gets a little confusing the essence is nothing other than the phenomenon the phenomenon is nothing other than the essence now this refers very strongly to things that were said earlier you know that if you're too mm -hmm. ironic then you're always saying the essence is somewhere else those these phenomenon in front of me i'm going to treat them i'm going to purely negate them i guess in your own work uh i mean why would it be it sounds like don't be ironic why is he saying this is the right way to do it right right we we yeah from the concept of irony it seemed as if irony involves this contradiction between essence and phenomenon the phenomenon being what it is you are saying on the surface and the essence being the true significance of what you're doing or saying why would the phenomenon here coincide with the essence i mean maybe i'm reminded of nietzsche's phrase superficiality or profundity out of superficiality so that you get to a point where, where you the aesthetic surface of the thing is the profound part of it it's not doesn't become profound by signifying anything deeper or superficiality out of i don't know i can't remember the phrase but in any but case it was part of that um, fashion episode too that you know this is yeah this was sort of yeah so i i mean perhaps it has something to do with this is something particular to artistic activity itself so it's, it's one thing to do rhetorical irony it's one thing to do socratic irony it's another thing to be doing art where one can see why it's necessary that the phenomenon 
be the essence so that the what's happening in the story is not you're not trying to communicate a message in other words mm -hmm. um you don't have a secret agenda behind the narrative that um that that every that's you know for which the story the narrative is an ulterior motive something like that i don't know if i'm on, on the right track here but so maybe he's ex explains this essence is nothing other than the phenomenon phenomenon is nothing other than the essence with the next sentence possibility is not so prudish as to be unwilling to enter into any actuality but actuality is possibility so that seems you know again sort of looking at this uh bad faith uh sartrean existentialist you are if you say my actuality is my possibility my actuality is my essence I mean, that's another way of saying my, the phenomenon is the essence. That seems like mm -hmm. bad faith. That seems like unironic. Right. You should have, well, you should have a loose relation with actuality. You should not re reject actuality and say, my possibility is freedom and it is, is ever revolving. And it does, no, no, do do the thing. It is. It, it really is a part of you. It's an aspect of you, but it is only an aspect. It's not the whole thing. So act the actuality you know, whether it's your life or this artwork you have created, um, that is one of your possibilities. It is, you know, take responsibility for it, but don't equate it with yourself. It's merely an element. Yeah. I like that. That sounds right. All right. Next paragraph. After all, what holds for the poet existence holds also in some measure for every single individual's life. In other words, the poet does not live poetically by creating a poetic work. Or if it does not stand in any conscious and inward relation to him, his life does not have the inner infinity that is an absolute condition for living poetically. Thus, we also see poetry frequently finding an outlet through unhappy individualities. Indeed, the painful destruction of the poet is a condition for the poetic production. That was all a parenthetical. Uh, so his life does not have the inner infinity that's a, a condition for living poetically, but he lives poetically only when he himself is oriented and thus integrated in the age in which he lives, is positively free in the actuality to which he belongs. But anyone can live poetically in this way. With the rare gift, the divine good fortune to be able to let what is poetically experienced, let what is poetically experienced take shape and form itself poetically, remains, of course, the enviable fate of the chosen few. So he seems to be, he seems to be um, arguing against the kind of tragic artist who, you know, who who says who puts themselves in opposition to society and maybe they're self destructive and hey, all my favorite jazz artists are were heroin addicts and I'm just going to do heroin and be this countercultural. Uh, <laughs> drug addicted whatever right i'm going to reject all the norms of society and disengage from it and be a poet that way and i i think he's rejecting that right painful just i got that from the painful destruction of the poet is conditioned for the poetic production production as if i have to be the agonized um artist and and inhabit a position of nihilism or something yeah, it's hard hard for me to tell uh the the poet existence like whether this is something that I, I know throughout a lot of the section he's been just saying we don't want the poet existence to to reduce yourself to the poet is to debase yourself doing poetry is fine but living the poet existence is mm -hmm. is too much uh, but or is he saying well, there's good ways of doing the poet existence and there's bad ways of doing the poet existence. Any, any poet is living the poet existence. It's just a question of how you approach it. You do need the inner infinity. Uh, and he does it, seem to be <clears throat> endorsing living poetically. Yes. The poet and, does and, not live poetically. Yeah. But and and, that's associated and having with having the, the inner, inner infinity, infinity is mm -hmm. good. So that I think that that meant that, you know, you, you retain that, that distance, uh, inwardly i i could mm -hmm. create anything i can you know change i have a flexibility of mind that allows me to change my attitude towards things as opposed to the outer infinity which is bad which is to say 
I'm not I'm going to actually settle on anything. I'm not going to I'm not going to be a poet. I'm not going to be a religious person. I'm just going to merely play act all those things. That is is that right that that's the outer infinity that shows you have a lack of integrity whereas some of the house the inner infinity, well that's just a mental flexibility and that's that's a good thing. And you need that for poet, poetic, you know, that sort of part and parcel of needing irony to to make art at all. Yeah, I think he's saying we you have to stay engaged with life and inhabit this goes towards what you were saying with existentialism, right? We have essences and we have social responsibilities, we have our and personalities and things that we have to do and role our roles to play. And as the artist, we don't simply disengage from that to be nothing but the poet. We have to live those out but with some sort of ironic relation to them not not meaning that we're nihilists and we're we're just play acting but knowing that that's not you know if you're looking at it from the standpoint of an existentialist that we are also free and free to interpret that experience and in this case that um we're not entirely invested in that role or and even in the ethical standpoint i'm just thinking forward to right even to our role as ethical people i think for kierkegaard there's something higher than that and that's the religious standpoint that's the standpoint of faith so even when we're um very focused on living our lives ethically we have to be able to stand back from that that's not the ultimate that's not the absolute so the reason Does i that, thought the make any sense or yeah no i i think that makes sense uh so the first step in that maturity is uh living integrated in the age in which you live but yet positively free in the actuality to which you belong so that's at least going to get you out of the aesthetic, the poetic point of view um, to, but, but you're right. If you were strictly ethical, well, you probably wouldn't make any poetry, right? <laughs> that yeah. we need something beyond that. The religious is what's going to end up actually hooking you back up to the muse, you know, in a dialectical fashion that the, that the poetic is sort of the default that the people of his age, you know, that he's criticizing lived in, and the ethical is a is a needed and obvious response to that, and the religious is supposed to synthesize them. Yeah, yeah. We and with Schiller, we saw this idea that the aesthetic, in a way, is prior to the ethical and grounds it. And it's through an aesthetic education that you would even mm, get the mm -hmm. ethical. Um, I, when I think about these guys and the and this yeah trajectory that we're doing in Romanticism thinking about well what's the yeah, what's more fundamental what's the priority and i think the romantics were trying to take it back to the aesthetic as a way of getting in touch with the absolute which is kind of making the aesthetic into a quasi religious experience and kierkegaard seems to want mm -hmm. to disentangle those two things and put faith ahead both of the ethical and the, the aesthetic uh, so oh, anybody sorry. can live poetically in in the good way of you know having the right however of course he says few people can actually let what is poetically experienced take shape and form itself poetically in other words actually create artworks that are that that capture this thing this experience that we can all have if we're well adjusted right all right to be controlled in this way, to be halted in the wind, in the wild infinity into which it rushes ravenously, by no means indicates that irony should now lose its meaning or be totally discarded. On the contrary, when the individual is properly situated, and this he is through the curtailment of irony, only then does irony have its proper meaning, its true validity. In our age, there has been much talk about the importance of doubt for science and scholarship. But what doubt is to science, irony is to personal life. Just as scientists maintain that there is no true science without doubt, so it may be maintained with the same right that no genuinely human life is possible without irony. As soon as irony is controlled, it makes a movement opposite to that in which uncontrolled irony declares its life. 
Irony limits, finitizes, or finitizes, and circumscri- circumscribes and thereby yields truth, actuality, content. It disciplines and punishes and thereby yields balance and consistency. Irony is disciplinary and feared only by those who do not know it, but loved by those who do. Anyone who does not understand irony at all, who has no ear for its whispering, lacks eo ipso, precisely thereby, what could be called the absolute beginning of personal life. He lacks momentarily what momentarily is indispensable for personal life. He lacks the bath of regeneration and rejuvenation. Irony's baptism of purification that rescues the soul from having its life in finitude, even though it is living energetically and robustly in it. He does not know the refreshment and strengthening that come with undressing when the air gets too hot and heavy and diving into the sea of irony. Not in order to stay there, of course, but in order to come out healthy, happy, and buoyant and to dress again. Awesome. Yeah, that's that that paragraph is why I want us to do this. <laughs> really awesome. Um yeah, so it's you know, irony is not this thing where you detach from life and you're not earnest about anything in the same way that doubt doesn't mean you stop looking for the truth and stop doing science in a way those two things are are necessary to each other. So it and if that's the case, you know, so like Socratic skepticism motivates inquiry. It doesn't motivate giving up. It's not relativism. Um, and I wonder if irony plays this role in life. It in you know it it, it can encourage one to seek out situations in which you are are. De- in, in other words, it can it can motivate you to seek out dedication in life or faith it can have actually that effect you know it's like the old idea that faith and doubt are actually intricately related and and, and can't be disentangled so maybe one of the things wrong with romanticism is that like rousseau it might glorify uh, a lack of reflectivity that you know i i just wish i could unironically enjoy my relationships. I wish I could unironically enjoy this shitty pop music that you're listening to. I wish I could unironically get angry. Like this is what the romantic. And I think uh, Nietzsche might be guilty of some of this. Certainly he sounds like this some of the time, but like Kierkegaard, you know, he would admit that like, you know, we can't turn back the clock. You can't, there's no point in just then being in despair that you can't attain this innocence, right? We don't want to go back in Nietzsche's terms to to the master morality of these blonde beasts unreflectedly. Like, no, we've mm-hmm. gone through the process of becoming inward, of reflecting on ourselves. For for uh, for Nietzsche, that is Christian Christian self self torture. <laughs> and so, what what is the the next dialectical step we should come out of that with? Is something that yes we do seize the day and get into things and really involve ourselves and have deep honest relationships but then we can pull back at any point and kind of observe ourselves and get into it and pull back and do this in a controlled way this is the art of living is like not getting too far into it but also not standing always on the outside not feeling anything yeah it reminds me of the it reminds me of the stoic distinction between good and bad on the one hand and what is preferable and not preferable on the other because the typical critique of the stoic was that well you're just advocating complete disengagement from life mm-hmm. why would anyone do anything and then the stoic comes back and says well no there's still what is preferable and not preferable and i'm still going to be working um i'm still going to be rich and working for the emperor <laughs> <laughs> if I want, right? In the case of Seneca, until I have to kill myself. But um, so that living, yeah, living life and dedication and commitment and those sorts of things are not incompatible with stoicism or with irony or any number of other 
um, positions like that in the same way that science is not incompatible with doubt. What doubt is to science, irony is to personal life. You need to be able to stand back from seeing things that, you know, the latest scientific discovery in order to be able to continue to refine it. So whatever it is that you're taking earnestly in your personal life, if it's to have any forward trajectory, we also need to be able to stand back from that. And, you know, you can see this in politics, right? People get wrapped up in a political position to the point where it interferes general, gen, generally with their cognitive processes and ability to enjoy life. It's not just about reflecting on the political position and refining it, although I think that's mm -hmm. important. It has a very general, you know, you become the serious man, it has a very general effect on one's character. So you have to be able to care passionately, passionately about some political issue without it robbing you of your, your humanity, for instance, and making it so that you are you know, because you care about justice for one group of people, you're demonizing some other swath of, swath of people, something like that. So the thing we're going to be looking for, as I think, you know, to the extent that we get so far enough in Kierkegaard to think about his rel religiosity, is whether he is guilty of being the serious man or whether this take on irony allows him that, no, no, he's post, he's two dialectical steps past that. And I think of Ricoeur, that the Rakur episode that he was specifically like, yeah, I want to be a Christian, but I want to be a Christian post Nietzsche, post Marx. I want to mm. take those critiques into account and not be drawn into, you know, so maybe that you, one of the things that comes out of that is you, you sort of live lightly in a way you don't, you know, so he was specifically, we were reading that in the context of how do you read specific passages from the Bible? And you certainly don't mm. read them such that, uh, you know, a man who lies with a man shall die and then become like some sort of fanatic anti-gay bigot or whatever. Like the, mm. there are more subtle ways in line with keeping it in perspective, I guess is the way that we would put that, you know, if you're a very politically oriented guy, you know, be an activist, but keep it in perspective, be a, a stoic activist, be a... a an activist who is still open to alternate points of view, et cetera. And so the same thing, oddly enough, should be the case with religion, even though religion should be the thing, according to Kierkegaard, that you fully leap into with your whole heart. Well, is it with your whole heart or is just the structure of the heart such that it can't actually make itself the servant? You know, if you say, I am now choosing God, so therefore I am the servant of God, I'm abnegating my my free choice like that would be a wrong approach to religion you have to actually be a human being who is religious not a, a religious automaton mm. yeah i like that although i'm yeah now now i i do find this confusing yeah is he just trying to have his cake and eat it too yeah i, <laughs> I don't know how irony works with faith how those fit together exactly but. all right continuing page 327 therefore if at times someone is heard talking with great superiority about irony in the infinite striving in which it runs wild, one may certainly agree with him, but insofar as he does not perceive the infinity that moves in, in irony, he stands not above but below irony. So he's not controlling his irony. Hmm. So it is always whenever we disregard the dialectic of life. It takes courage not to surrender to the shrewd or sympathetic counsel of despair that allows a person to erase himself from the number of the living. But this does not necessarily mean that every sausage peddler fed and fattened on self-confidence has more courage than the person who has succumbed to despair. It takes courage when sorrow would delude one, when it reduce all joy to sadness, all longing to privation, every hope to recollection. It takes courage to will to be happy. But this does not necessarily mean that every full-grown adult infant with his sweet sentimental smile, <laughs> his joy intoxicated eyes, has more courage than the person who yielded to grief and forgot to smile. So it is also with irony. Even though one must warn against irony as against a seducer, so must one also commend it as a guide. Okay. Yeah, I love all this stuff about the, you know, Sausage peddlers fed and fattened on self-confidence. 
Um, so that's not courage necessarily. We can't compare. You can't can't look at them compared to the person who commits suicide and say, you know, um, yeah, the person who commits suicide is a coward. People who are just kind of smug and self content, unreflectively in life, they're the ones who are um, courageous and happy. So what is he saying at the very end here? So it is with also with irony. So you warn against irony. Uh, what's the analogy here? I'm trying to connect this to. I mean, irony being self-consciousness and ultimately disengagement and, and a tendency towards nihilism. So right. you want that disengagement, but as we've been saying in measured doses, it's definitely better to be the nihilist that is a step further from being a mere unreflective. You don't want to be right. the blonde beast. You want to at least get to the despiser of life, but we want to get past despiser of life. The blonde beast somehow became a sausage peddler. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so you don't want to be the smug, unreflective, quote unquote, confident person in the same way that you don't want to be the nihilist style of ironist. And yet, confidence is something we want and irony is something we want when they are done right and kierkegaard unlike nietzsche in making this point is not being bringing in sexism here at least he talks about the full-grown adult infant with his sweet sentimental smile his joy intoxicated eyes i could very clearly see nietzsche saying something obnoxious about you know the female figures in his life <laughs> In that yeah, context. it's time. It's time for infants to start getting yeah. theirs. I, I mean, <laughs> adult infants. <laughs> they've been <laughs> sexism, racism. There's got to be something that's just focused oh, on oh, infants. Oh, I see. Child childism. <laughs> How dare you condemn this infant as childish? No, actually, that that's a stereotype <laughs> that works pretty well. That's that's okay. We're, we're okay with that. Yeah. <laughs> We keep going all right yeah so did you just read the last one uh commended as a guide yeah that we're we have the last paragraph okay. still in 327 or no, should particularly we particularly in our age um oh we do have a bit more are we going to get we, through it we today have two and a quarter pages still left in this and how many have we read uh th three and a half all right so we, yeah let's do Let's do another part on that. All right. Yeah, I think this is we, great. This is great. I wish there was, were a part of the part of the official reading. So, <laughs> I mean, I added it, but I don't think Dylan got to the end of this. There was, you know, if you're going to have a whole section on on the playwright soldier here that you have to skip over, then uh, hmm. one must one might think that uh, one might get tired. I think that is the the theme of our Kierkegaard is that uh, you might get tired before the good part. So, so having some yeah i i have to say is. yeah it's it's hard going it really is hard going this you know if, if it were all like this it would be amazing <laughs> but right. he's very he's it's like you know it's like going to see experimental art or something like that you just have to gird your loins for it and... well thanks for your support uh I know you're hearing on this on the Partial Exam with Life feed or, or maybe even the public YouTube. Uh, so we hope you enjoy this part of it. If you want to hear the whole rest of it, we'll have just, just one more little section on this uh, in a future one just for Close Reads folks. So Close Reads or patreon.com slash Close Reads Philosophy or uh, at the $10 level on the Partial Exam in Life Patreon page. So long, everybody. Bye.